So welcome back to All Hell Can't Stop Us, my kind of weekly broadcast slash podcast slash live stream slash whatever. And uh, this week we have a couple more things that we're going to go through. Uh, the first one is going to be queued up right away. Hopefully you enjoy it. Uh, this is going to be uh, hopefully a recurring theme. So uh, here we go. This is our first track. away that was peace on earth by fabric although uh triad also uh did that as well actually i think that might be the the triad version uh so um either way uh fabric is part of triad and so uh the two are uh kind of creative commons musicians uh and so they are uh they they produce at least four albums that i have uh, a copy of and all of them are fantastic so uh, I'm going to try to find a link to one of them or, or more of them, uh, especially the one with that uh, particular song on it. It was uh, pretty good and, and kind of a, a really good example that, you know, uh, Creative Commons music doesn't have to be terrible. It, it can actually be good. And so what 
uh, is this that you're kind of watching or listening to? Nobody's watching right now. Uh, but assuming you find it in the future, um, I, I am trying to do this kind of weekly podcast to give uh, you an alternative to the sources of media in your life, uh, especially media like the CBC, uh, Fox News, etc. cetera. Uh, just kind of like little bits and pieces of news and hopefully uh, Creative Commons music or public domain music every week. Uh, and so this is going to be, like I say, a recurring theme. Uh, so let's get into what's going on in the world of Jeff. So the first thing that I kind of want to talk about is last week I kind of slagged a little bit on the, the religions of the world and the, especially, especially the Abrahamist uh, religions like Islam and Christianity. And so this week I, I wanted to kind of take kind of like a step uh, in the other direction, which is to uh, look at uh, one of the things that Islam in particular got right. Uh, and I didn't uh, grab the head either, uh, the quote, uh, so it, it's not going to be an exact quote here, but uh, the basic idea here is that one of the things that Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, figured was a important thing uh, is to be mindful of death. And to that one of his pieces of advice uh, to his followers, uh, to all Muslims, is to, uh, you know, occasionally be near funerals uh, so that you are encouraged to think about death. Now, the reason that he was encouraging people to think about death might be different than my particular reason. Uh, you know, his his reason is to, to remind people of an afterlife, uh, but it's actually, I think, good advice in that it's worth taking some time out of your life every once in a while, like not every day, not every, like, you know, all the time, uh, but if you can walk by a cemetery, uh, or if you can uh, go, you know, if nobody near and dear to you is, is you know, dying, necessitating you to go to a funeral, if you can find a way to just kind of be around the people who are going through that, um, you know, it, ideally you'd be, you know, giving them kind of some sort of a moral or emotional support, that would be nice. Uh, but even kind of without that, just kind of as a, a clue, as a reminder, kind of like the, the skull in, what, what was it, Hamlet, Shakespeare's Hamlet or something like that, where, you know, the, the guy talks to the skull and it reminds him of, of his own mortality. And, and that's an important thing because we are all mortal. We are all eventually going to die. Even with life extension, eventually something's going to catch us and we're going to be done. And so it, it's important to kind of remember that. And I, I, I had a dream right before this podcast um, that kind of, you know, to, to, I was I'm talking about this in my dreams, so I kind of wanted to to bring it out into the real world here. But it, it's just an important thing because it forces us to evaluate what's important in our life. Because there, we only have so much time here, and we only have so much time to accomplish the things that we want to accomplish. Because death will eventually take us. Death will eventually take the people we care about, uh, and it's important to kind of keep that in mind. So with that kind of in the back of our minds that we're kind of thinking about that, uh, one of the th what, what's one of the, the first things that kind of happened this past week, uh, or at least in the past couple of weeks, uh, and that is uh, Chelsea Manning uh, being put in jail again. Now, uh, Chelsea Manning, if you haven't heard of her, uh, released some video to WikiLeaks back when WikiLeaks was really, really... You know, not not all that old. It was still kind of a new organization uh, that showed quite clearly. Uh, it, it was a lot, you know, not not a super short video, a super uh, short but video. It uh, but it, it showed the, that the uh, uh, U.S. military, uh, the US military or the particular US military, military showed, showed uh, had killed uh, some journalists and a family that had come to help those journalists. Um, they were not terrorists. They were not you know, fighting, they were, they were complete non-combatants, they uh, were just in uh, Iraq, covering the Iraq war, uh, these journalists were killed. It was probably a big mistake, and you can hear uh, when you have, you know, the audio and the video to see exactly what happened there, how it could have kind of gone wrong, and some of the, you know, the, the rhetoric, rhetoric that was going on, how they made the mistake, and why those journalists in particular got killed, and uh, you, it, it's just this little bit of context that would have been really nice to know at the time that it happened. But at the time that it happened, the U.S. government refused to admit that it did anything wrong, that its soldiers had even killed the journalists, 
the you know the the even word journalists like there was basically no discussion on it at all and evidence for what had happened was kind of hard to come by because it's not like you could just like go you know from thunder bay here and walk to iraq and cover it and then you know see for yourself you have to rely on these journalists who are there and one of those journalists who went to iraq uh i got wound up dying because of this and the cover-up that you know kept these journalists from you know having some sense of justice or some sense of what what exactly happened uh, shown to the world was a terrible thing and it went on for years and finally chelsea manning showed the world what happened now uh we have a, a kind of a comment from the, the peanut gallery here you know no more drones yes right on no more drones but in this case it was a human being there was basically no robots at all involved in this particular case Chelsea Manning's uh, collateral murder video, uh, you can go look it up, and it, it was even before all the, the, the robot thing was an important thing. Uh, th this was a human being making a mistake, uh, people died because of it, and then the U.S. government covered it up. And it's the cover-up that's kind of the, the big problem here, and the pro then on top of that, after she released this video as a member of the U.S. military, uh, she was arrested. She faced a trial. The trial was a little bit of a show trial, whatever, but, um, you know, she, she at least had a trial. She was put in jail. Uh, she was eventually released, uh, you know, years later. Uh, as part of her imprisonment, she was tortured. Uh, the U.S. government does torture some of the people that it imprisons. She is a good example of one of those people. Uh, she was subject to torture. So she, this is a person who knows what it is like to be on the inside of the U.S. kind of military prison system. She knows pretty close to the worst that it's capable of. Like, there, there's not much worse than torture, right? There's, there's death, right? She could be killed. Uh, but I think at this point in her life, having been in solitary confinement and you know, exposed to this you know, terrible treatment by the U.S. government, uh, she knew what she was doing. So it is all the more remarkable that when she was called to testify in front of a secret court, uh, the fact that they even have secret courts, what is going on with the states here? But she she was called in front of this secret grand jury court, and she refused to testify. Now, I haven't, I, I've been kind of following this a little bit, and I haven't seen that much of the details as far as exactly why she didn't uh, testify. Uh, but regardless, like this, this is someone who knows that she is going to be, uh, from her testifying against a WikiLeaks, which is basically what this grand jury, the secret court, is about, um, that there's, you know, she stood up to it and she said, no, I'm not going to give the details of whatever she's not going to give details about uh, to implicate WikiLeaks as an organization, as a journalistic organization. Um, and so the U.S. government is, you know, punishment for that, put her back in jail. And we really haven't heard much from her since that happened. And it's uh, really kind of unfortunate. And so I, I have an article here from the New Statesman, uh, which is, quote, Chelsea Manning is in jail. Our silence is shameful. Uh, the Department of Justice persecution of Manning is simply judicial cruelty. It deserves our full attention. Quote, as I write these words, Chelsea Manning it is in a jail cell. Uh, then it kind of goes through the, what, she had done, she'd been in jail before. Uh, da, da, da. Um, uh, talks a little bit of the Afghan war diaries, which, by the way, I've read. Um, there is there was probably some good reason why you wouldn't want the Afghan war diaries released in real time, but as a historical document, they're kind of important to know exactly what happened with the Afghan war, and especially since we are still kind of engaged in the Afghan war, um, a war that has been longer than World War II. Uh, it is kind of an important thing to know exactly what's going on there. Um, so, uh, so, quote, this time she's in prison for refusing to testify at a grand jury hearing, clearly intended at seeking prosecution of Julian Assange and possibly others involved in WikiLeaks where, as disclosure, I worked for some time during that period, according to uh, this James Ball guy for the New Statement. 
uh, for its work in publishing these cables. So this is for the, the Afghan war diary and some really old cables. Some people, when they talk about this, think that this has something to do with Donald Trump and that Donald Trump and WikiLeaks had somehow you know, coordinated to take down Hillary Clinton, which there's probably some you know, argument for that having happened. But this is for the old stuff. This is still for uh, prosecuting WikiLeaks and Julian Assange for things that happened you know, around 10 years ago. So let, let's kind of continue to go through this. Quote, only someone blinkered to the minutiae of legal procedure, which technically allows such incarcerations to compel testimony, could fail to see the staggering injustice at play here. Manning is being per, per, persecuted needlessly for failing to play a part in a show trial to a grand jury which does not need her testimony. Julian Assange is, as has been publicly stated in outlets across the world, a terrible housemate, an egotistical prick, and a misogynist who deserves to face proper judicial procedure in Sweden. He is also, when it comes to covering his ass legally, an idiot. Uh, okay, might disagree with some of that, but whatever. If the U.S. wants to prosecute Assange, they do not need Chelsea Manning's testimony to attempt it. They have her electronic chat logs with Adrian Lamo, or Lamo, um, the so-called so journalist who turned her in to the authorities. They have their own records from that investigation. They have her extensive testimony from her 2013 court martial. They have the evidence from WikiLeaks close, or volunteers close to Assange, who became a paid FBI informant. Thanks to the running habit of F, or WikiLeaks sources to end up caught by authorities, they even have records of Assange working with hackers in 2012 to connect this, to a server being operated by the FBI. Okay, so like they got a lot of stuff here. Uh, dragging Manning in front of a or quote, dragging Manning in front of a grand jury then is uh, simply prosecutorial overreach, an overzealous and vindictive act at aiming to punish her again for an act which many rightly see as one of heroism and one which even the most ardent critic could not call a selfish or, victor or violent crime. But the whole prosecution is a dangerous one. You do not need to be an admirer of Julian Assange to believe punishing him in this way is a challenge to a free press and a free society. Which, it, it goes to the point. We used to live in a free society where you could call uh, the government to account when it, commit, or when it committed acts of murder. The United States used to be a country that would champion uh, a whistleblower of that magnitude. Uh, but unfortunately, this is not what is happening to it. Uh, WikiLeaks and Chelsea Manning, uh, and so she's now in jail because of it. Uh, this is a threat to uh, other media sources uh, because basically the, what's happening here is the state, the U.S. government is compelling testimony from a source against the journalists who were who she was feeding information to. So this is, there's a lot of different kinds of investigations that go on where you really don't want the, the government to go in and force journalists to give away sources and force sources to give away information of journalists. Like the, the journalist source relationship, it's kind of like the, the, the lawyer client relationship. There, there's an important degree of being able to work together on these sorts of things. And unfortunately, there's a, a, a you know case being made against WikiLeaks that is going to uh, make it more difficult to report on the truth in the United States. These this is going to have spillover spillover effects in places like Canada and so on and so forth. So uh, that's one of the things that's going on in the world right now. Uh, I don't know really what one can do about it uh, other than be aware of it, talk about what's going on with Chelsea Manning, you know, maybe follow her uh, account on Twitter because I think she has a support network that's capable of eventually relaying information in and out of the prison system there, that sort of thing. Uh, but kind of keep an eye out because Chelsea Manning did stand up for, or, you know, against the U.S. government in a way that was, uh, you know, for the public's interest, uh, both at, at home and abroad. So it's important to know about. Okay, so that, enough about Manning for a moment. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is Tor. Now, Tor is important to the Chelsea Manning case because uh, Tor is one of the ways that WikiLeaks communicates and is able to maintain its ability uh, to communicate with sources like Chelsea Manning. Uh, so it, what what is Tor? Tor is a uh, service that runs on the internet uh, that allows you to uh, connect from your computer to other computers on the internet uh, in a way that is uh, I, I don't want to say, you know, 100% foolproof private, uh, but it's 
a step in that direction. So how it works is you have your computer, you have, it connects to a second computer, uh, the second computer connects to a third computer, maybe there's a fourth computer, and then it connects to the, the computer you want to connect to. Now, it handles most of the details of this. Uh, once you have Tor set up in your web browser or your email client or whatever else you do on the, inter or on the internet, um, it, it will handle the details of connecting to the three hops between you and the computer you want to connect to. And that computer might even be Facebook. Facebook offers a Tor uh, portal, so you don't even have to exit the Tor network, exit these middle computers. It, one of those middle computers is actually Facebook. And so it, it's it telling that even a company that is interested in uh, breaching our privacy as deeply and as thoroughly as Facebook is interested in still supporting Tor because so many people rely on it. But unfortunately, even though there's millions of people worldwide who use it, uh, it's still not enough. Uh, the, the more people who use it, the more, the better it could possibly work. Now, there, there's kind of a trade-off there because the more people use it, the more people have to run these kind of middle nodes uh, inside the network, and the more people have to use specifically that last hop, uh, what are called exit nodes, uh, allow the, the people who use the Tor network to access the outside world of the internet. Uh, if not enough people run those, the Tor network will get slower as more people jump on. Uh, but the more people who use Tor, uh, the, the kind of more confused the middle connections become. And so the harder it becomes for someone outside of the Tor network, like the U.S. government, the NSA, CSIS here in Canada, uh, CSAC here in Canada, the, uh, and you know, Mossad, MI5, all these intelligence agencies, but or intelligence agencies, but not entire, not just intelligence agencies. Also, your internet service provider, uh, if it's Bell or SaskTel or whatever, uh, is going to have a have a difficult time spying on you, uh, maybe for the RCMP or whoever else, um, if you use this network, because all it's going to see is encrypted traffic, uh, and it is it is possible for these networks uh, to block people from using Tor. And in some countries, they do this, like for example, China, Venezuela, I think Zimbabwe too. Uh, but for those countries, there are, it, it's kind of like a cat and mouse game. So there's ways to avoid the blocks. Uh, but the first step, if you still live in a country that's free enough for you to, to use this network, I would highly, highly recommend it. Uh, because it is a way for you to have a private life online, it is a, or at least the first step of a private life online. Uh, and so if you want to communicate with WikiLeaks, for example, they use SecureDrop, which is built on top of Tor. You need to use uh, Tor to access it. Uh, if you want to communicate with me, I use Ricochet, ricochet.im, uh, which is built on top of Tor. So much is built on top of Tor in, in this kind of era uh, that it, it's kind of an important tool that we should all have access to. And I mean we should all have access to. Every phone, every computer, every school computer, everything that uses or that people are allowed to communicate over, people should have the ability to do so without having their conversation recorded and parsed through and gone through by their government, by you know the the the, the, the secret police. This is something that you know used to only happen in the Soviet Union, but now is happening everywhere in the world. And so we should use Tor to at least have that first step of getting out of this situation. Um, and so that, that that's kind of, I'll, I'll leave a link to Tor. Uh, it is not that hard to set up uh, usually, but it should, if, if you're the, 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 the techie in your life or your, the, the place where you get your software isn't offering Tor by default, you should talk to them about that. Find a way to get Tor uh, or at least find a way to get Tor to be the default. It is not something that you just connect to once in a while and browse the internet safely for maybe porn or whatever else you want to keep private from the world. And no, you want to use it for everything. Every internet connection uh, it, with some very, very minor exceptions should be run by Tor. Okay, so uh, that's enough kind of about Tor. What's the next thing? So the next thing I talked last week about the, the INF treaty. And I want to talk a little bit more about that because there's an article, uh, there's been a couple of articles, but one specifically from Newsweek, uh, quote, U.S., Russia, and France all launch nuclear-capable missiles within hours of one another as treaty falls apart. This was actually recorded, or this 
post came out on, uh, let's see, February 6th, uh, 2019. So again, the, the fact that this is happening, this has been a, a couple of weeks, but it, it's still important to know about. I didn't know about this until I was looking for information for this show. So let's go through it. Quote, the United States, Russia, and France have all test launched nuclear capable missiles within hours of one another as international fears of a global arms control collapse heightened. The U.S. and Russia have, in recent days, suspended the 1987 Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces (INF) Treaty, banning land-based missiles with ranges from 310 to 3,420 miles, following Washington's accusations that Moscow violated the deal with its new Novator 9M729 missile. The two sides continue to swap threats of escalation. The three countries believed to have most nuclear weapons in the world uh, demonstrated their strategic capabilities. Uh, first, the French military said Tuesday that its Air Force conducted a rare test Monday of its nuclear-capable medium-range air-to-surface missiles, then the U.S., then Russia, um, blah, 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 blah. So, uh, let's see here. Uh, let me talk a little bit about where this is going to kind of go from there. They have a picture of the countries holding the world's nuclear arsenals, which right now is Russia with 6,800. The United States at 6,600, France at 300, China at 270, which, uh, hard to say if that's a legitimate number. Uh, the UK at 215, Pakistan at 140, India at 130, Israel at 80, North Korea at 20. Now, keeping in mind, uh, this is not, uh, I think this is number, numbers of warheads. Uh, and the important metric is not just the number of warheads, but also the megatons that those warheads are capable of. Now, the Russia specifically, as I think I talked about last week, has one warhead that's 100 megatons. Uh, I think that was, um, or, or more. Uh, and so one of those will basically end human life. Uh, 100 of these uh, kind of regular warheads will probably do it. Uh, it's hard to say. Some of them might just be small tactical nuclear weapons uh, that in and of themselves won't destroy humanity, but will probably end humanity by... Uh, tit for tat escalation from them being fired, but this just this chart alone suggests that Russia, the United States, France, China, the United Kingdom, Pakistan, and India, and Israel is getting close. So you can imagine that they're probably there too if they have any secret capability. All have the ability to end the human species, and so. The, the reason that I wanted to talk about this is that I think that there should be a wave of protests against, it, or against this. This is something that is threatening our lives. This is something that is threatening our families, threatening our, our, our cultures, our, our, our whole species is under threat by this. Uh, that Russia, the United States, and France have seen fit uh, to even flex these muscles at all is an affront to all free societies, to all thinking people, to all human beings on this planet. And every single one of us who has the ability to should be speaking out against it to our elected representatives, to in you know whatever means or form that we have that still working for us. Now in Canada, uh, unfortunately, uh, we do not have the ability to do all that much for protests against this. Uh, since C-51 was passed under the Harper government with the Trudeau liberal support, uh, our ability to go out in large numbers and protest things like our lives being threatened by nuclear war uh, from Russia, France, and the United States uh, is really restricted. And so it's uh, not something that we here in Canada can do all that much about. Now, could we go out in the streets and, and protest this anyway? Yeah, we probably could. Could we wind up being kind of arrested by our government uh, and put in jail uh, in revolving door prison uh, for the rest of our lives? Yeah, that could probably happen too. Uh, is it worth it given that what's at stake here? Maybe. Hard to say. I'll let you guys think about that. But the, 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 the important thing that I wanted to talk about this week is this kind of disconnect between our, our, our kind of lack or the important things that we need to be protesting to stop. Uh, to have you know use our political pressure what we have to to change the world to to slow this this arms race down to stop these billions and trillions of dollars being spent on nuclear weapons uh, and our lack of kind of being able to do so thanks to uh, who 
is still in power our Trudeau government uh, here in Canada. So uh, the uh, it is important to when the election comes or when when the the Trudeau Liberals start talking in public about any other topic. It really doesn't matter what topic it is. Maybe SNC Live Live, whatever it is. Uh, one of the things we should be talking about in response is what are you doing to NC51? What are you doing to stop our inability to resist terrible things that are happening to the world and terrible things that could be happening to us? Uh, that should be the number one response to basically anything they say. And when we see groups of people who are willing to stand up specifically against C-51 and specifically to stop the Trudeau government and to end their, their rule, uh, it is worth considering, even if you don't agree with everything they say, to put aside your differences with them and to say, okay, well, you know, there's a lot of things you know, going on in the world and there's some things we can agree and disagree with, but this is the most important thing here in Canada is to get this right of protest back, to be able to peacefully protest, to be able to uh, group in, in large groups and express important things that have to be said. Uh, so that, that's kind of one of the things I, I wanted to go through today. So the next thing uh, is a post here on Facebook by one Osman Farouki, if I'm pronouncing that right, uh, quote, uh, and this is in response to the a uh, terrorist attack in Christchurch, New Zealand, this past week. Uh, quote, I feel so sad. We begged you to stop amplifying and normalizing hatred and racism. But you told us that we were politically correct and freedom of speech was more important. The more you gave the far right a platform, the power, more powerful they got. We begged you, unquote. So uh, I wanted to talk about this tweet because this is an important thing that's also going on. So while we're restricted from being able to protest, against violence and against the far right and against the alt right uh, in, in mass protests. While we're restricted from our ability to work together to, to achieve peaceful ends, uh, th there are still some people that are willing to uh, organize and co collaborate to, to work against those ends. Uh, so they aren't as concerned at, at C-51 because they're not as concerned with the rule of law. They're not concerned with peace. They're not as concerned with a world that is doing anything other than, like, for example, spinning into a race war. Uh, they're, they're not concerned with any of that. So they're not held back as much by C-51. They're not held back as much by these uh, restrictions that hold back peace-loving, law-abiding people. Uh, so th in this particular case, this is someone who's basically saying that uh, the people on the right should have less access to the internet. Now, I'm putting a little bit of words in his mouth here. Uh, Osman may or may not be saying this exactly, but there, there is this sentiment out there. If you look on the internet, you can find people who want to silence the people that they disagree with. And this is one of the reasons why C-51 is even in the law, because Dawah al-Islamiyah was pr producing all this propaganda and terrorist uh, material that was the, the media itself was attractive, and so the government restricted our being able to access it and share it and talk about it in a positive manner. That particular sentence may have even been, you know, somewhat uh, almost too positive. Uh, so, like, it's, it's hard. It's it's hard to even you know think and, and and to kind of step over yourself to think about how to even say things uh, to be so politically correct as to abide by that law. And so when someone is saying that, oh, you know, we are being not politically correct enough and that we have too much freedom of speech and too much freedom of expression, uh, this, is, this is going the wrong direction. This is conflating uh, people's access and ability to say something without being amplified with the, the amplification factor that social media allows. So this conflating is, is happening, kind of blurring the lines between, uh, you know, having a private group or, or a public group that, you know, nobody pays attention to and a public group that is being, having its message spread uh, to other public groups or to, to groups that are, uh, you know, not as interested in it. It's, it. it's a blurring of those two kinds of things. 
And so it's important to keep those two different. Uh, it is, it should be expected that people should have the ability to publish and to speak whatever they want, even if they are saying terrible things, because there's always, or hopefully going to be someone on the other side to say, okay, well, you know, Daily Stormer or whatever, you know, you're publishing garbage. Uh, the, the, the half the things you say aren't true. The other half are spun to be completely dishonest or whatever, right? How, however you want to attack them. You could go through point by point, but most of the time you don't have to because even arguing against it, it, it will sometimes lend credibility that what they say is important enough to pay attention to. In a lot of cases, especially on the right, there's just no... There's nothing there. Uh, and so it's worth sometimes going and arguing against people on the right. It's worth sometimes, you know, having people on the right in your friend circle. Uh, and, and not all people on the right are, you know, as far right as, you know, let's say the Daily, Daily Stormer. There, there's a whole spectrum of people there ranging from, uh, you know, moderates and people even in our government uh, who represent the interests of wealth and power or whatever. Um, and there's also people who are, you know, just spun out into whatever their particular ideology and it's it's important to not when people like this osman are are are, are having a kind of freak out about this and yes it's understandable that when you know that there's a mass killing and especially if you know people involved like that that going back to the the, the funeral thing right you know death makes us think about things differently and maybe this is one of those things but at the same time uh it also uh, is important to, to keep that kind of clear thought uh, when these sorts of things are going on. That what kind of law happens when you make law or make policy change based on events like that, rather than the death that is always surrounding us and that is killing far more people uh, than whatever happened in New Zealand this week. Uh, I guarantee more people have died in New Zealand uh, due to causes that we're not talking about than the causes that he is in particular talking about. Uh, so it's worth focusing on that death, uh, finding out what is causing those people to die, uh, what is causing the, those families to suffer from those people in their lives dying. This in particular, it's important to, to try to like dig to see what, what is kind of going on. Why is the right, you know, making him so willing to censor them? Uh, that's important. But at the same time, we have to allow people to speak. You know, don't amplify the the, the all right. Uh, don't amplify the right if you know if they're not doing something that's deserving it. Uh, but sometimes they will point out something. Like for example, this tweet. I uh, I don't disagree with this guy, uh, but I think it's an important thing. Uh, you know, to, to point out that yes, a lot of people are going to agree with him uh, in in this day and age, and it's worth finding out why they think that it's acceptable to curtail freedom of expression and freedom of speech and, and kind of go through point by point and figure out if there's some way to, you know, to, to not do that, right? So uh, it is, and so it, it, it is important to, to maintain freedom of speech and maintain freedom of expression because that is the thing that differentiates us from them. There is no freedom of speech in Dawa al-Islamiyah. There is no freedom of speech or, or was none functionally in the Nazi Germany era when the far right had their heyday. There was no freedom of speech in so many places in the world at so many different points in history that that's actually the norm in human existence. The, there are more people who have been born, lived their lives, and died without any functional freedom of speech than there are who have lived in a country like Canada uh, up until the Harper and Trudeau governments, uh, like the United States up until, like, let's say, the Bush government or, or so. Um, and, and even to this day, like, there, there's a, a degree of freedom that we have. Like, I can do this video broadcast. I haven't been arrested yet. Uh, but the, the, even that degree is not the, the norm in human history. And so it's important to fight for when we have the chance to using the media that we have. Uh, and so uh, when people even give good reasons why we should get rid of it, uh, it's worth going to those reasons and you know figuring out where their flaw is. So uh, there's that. Uh, now it's going kind of back to C51. Uh, 
uh, it's what our, our first step should be to get rid of that C51. So uh, let's see here. How are we doing for time? Uh, I can't actually tell. Okay, so we're about right. So uh, I wanted to end this uh, week's broadcast with uh, something else from the voice of Long Island, which I, I mentioned uh, last week. I've been listening to the archives of going through. It's not something that you want to hear the whole thing, but they have some clips of interesting things in it. Uh, if you want me to talk about something uh, next week, uh, you can send it to me by Ricochet. Um, or um, if you have some Creative Commons music for me to play, uh, I'd love to, to give it, you know, more, or give more people access to it and, and make people more uh, aware of it. Um, this broadcast is currently live streamed, or live streamed on Facebook. Uh, I'd love to be able to, to broadcast it in other places. So if you have any ideas for that, let me know. Uh, you can also get it from YouTube and from me directly. Uh, stories uh, I talked about today uh, tended to come from, uh, oh, I actually missed one here. We'll talk about that next week. Uh, the Tor Project, the Calyx, uh, we'll actually talk about that next week. Uh, Chelsea Manning, WikiLeaks, Voice of Long Island, uh, and Schnitz uh, for is one link. Uh, and so uh, let's see, if you want to donate to this broadcast uh, so that I can have uh, kind of more resources to dedicate to it specifically, you can do so by subscriber, star villages, or Bitcoin. Uh, and I will play this ending audio. Hopefully you enjoy. Uh, let's see here. Going to the Eric Corley graduation commencement address in dub. Where else? Yeah. But on the voice of Long Island. Thank you. It's a pleasure to see everybody here on this fine autumn day. I want to thank everybody for coming and thank the university for putting on this Wonderful, wonderful event, event. Very, good, very good, very good, very good job. Well, the weather's not their fault. Oh, and also thank the uh, maintenance workers who wiped off 11,000 wet chairs this morning. I think they deserve a hand. Well, today marks a ceremonial occasion. An occasion of change that carries an assurance that tomorrow things just won't be the same anymore. I'm sure that within all of us there's a slight feeling of dread and certainly more than a little fear when we think about just what lies in the future. Well, there's nothing at all strange about this. We've been afraid of the future. Of the past comprehended. From the first day of nursery school to college graduation, anything that represents a change in our daily lives makes us nervous. But there's something about leaving college that's radically different from anything else we've ever done. Many of us, this day symbolizes something we've thought about for a long time. Entering the real world. The beginning of the rest of our lives. But what is this real world? Where is it? What is it like? And where does it begin? Is that, it? Is, that it? is that it across the tracks? Is it, is it, is it, is it in Port Jefferson or New York City or Plainview? One, one, one thing we seem able to agree upon, it's not like Stony Brook. Wherever this real world is, we won't find the kind of individual attention we've come to expect here. of us. There won't be hundreds of diverse organizations geared towards our specialized needs. And we'll never again be able to witness thousands of people from so many different races, religions, and backgrounds converging together in an atmosphere of harmony and cooperation. That is the world we've grown accustomed to here at Stony Brook. And it can't possibly be duplicated out there. 
but it seems to me as if we just might be coming down a bit too hard on the real world. After all, what is the real world? Aren't we a part of it? Haven't we always been? If so, then we should be able to take what we've learned here and apply it to this real world. Instead of fearing what's ahead, why not welcome it? Because what's ahead is us. Among the 4,000 or so of us graduating today, we're destined to travel to the four corners of the globe. And wherever we go, we'll take memories of Stony Brook with us. I've got some favorite memories of reading books under shady trees in the spring, waiting for buses outside the student union, sometimes for hours. Long nights in the library, ball parties, Oktoberfests, ice cream sandwiches at 2 o'clock in the morning, the Fine Arts Center, and of course, that mega structure over there that some of us can see, a creation that can never be repeated. Some say that's fortunate. I'm not so sure. I, I think there's quite a bit of character in such a unique concoction. Stony Brook had its bad points. When I first came here, getting good grades wasn't the objective. It was finding a parking space. A good deal of the campus was still mud, and long lines in the administration building were almost an everyday occurrence. So since then, the mud has disappeared. Parking seems to have become easier. And there aren't as many long lines in the administration building. But even with these hindrances, Stony Brook still had a lot to offer us if we took the time to look around. You know, a university such as this is an ideal place for the individual. And I, for one, came to value individuality more than anything during my time here. I always knew that every person ever created was unique in some way. However, you tend to spot individuality more easily than a place like this. People are so obviously different. Difference is a theme of the human race. And so is conflict. And that conflict is based upon the differences among all the people who comprise this world in the first place. Differences in thought, differences in background, differences in religion, etc. In other words, differences in the very things that make us individuals. Thus, individuality could be said to be the causes of all the problems in the world today. Maybe if we erased all these unique traits, we'd be able to logically and uniformly and then there wouldn't be any more problems. But then, there wouldn't be any more life. None that would be worth living. One of my favorite authors, John Stuart Mill, said in his writings on liberty, even despotism does not produce its worst effects, so long as individuality exists under it. And whatever crushes individuality is this despotism, by whatever name it may be called, and whether it professes to be enforcing the will of God or the injunctions of men. What Mill said holds true in any age. At this moment, there are people there are organizations and there, and there are governments that are trying to control and suppress individuals all over the world. They're doing this in the name of God, in the name of morality, and in the name of national interest. And we're by no means immune. Suppression is not a tactic that the leftists use, nor is it one of the right wing. It's found everywhere, in the old, in the young, and in every race. The desire to suppress individuality knows no sides. It's an inherent negative trait of the human race, one that we have to learn to overcome. Remember, a world without individuals a world, a world where, where everyone thinks, thinks and reacts, reacts in the, in the same, same way is a very easy world to manipulate. And there will always be those who want to silence us when we say something different or hide us when we don't conform to their standards. And there will always be those who want to control what we learn and what we read and what we watch on television. We have to watch out for them and we can't let them win. 
Without our individuality, we are nothing. nothing. Sure, it causes problems, but it also solves them. I honestly believe that if there is any purpose whatsoever in the existence of the human race, then that purpose is for us to learn how to use our individuality to prevent destructive conflict rather than initiate it. I think we've made a pretty good start here at Stony Brook. In fact, maybe we just might be able to teach the real, the real world a thing or two in this field. Well, there was so much to do here on this campus, yet so few of us had the time to break away from whatever it was we were engrossed in in order to try, try something new. And this, is and this is unfortunate because the whole purpose of a university is to expand the mind. There are too many who come to places like Stony Brook knowing exactly what it is they want and seeking to extract only the knowledge that they find relevant or worse, only the knowledge that they feel will be useful to them later in life. But how do we know what knowledge will be beneficial if we don't take a sampling of the many different forms in which it can be found. It's not unlike a large menu from which we choose our courses. If we keep taking the same thing over and over again, we'll be missing so much. There's a great deal of knowledge and experience that I know I missed out on here. I don't think a single member of this or any other class can say they've gotten every conceivable thing they could have possibly gotten out of their education. But I do know there's a great deal more that I would have missed had I not decided to branch out, experiment, try something new. Some of the most, of the most valuable, valuable moments for me at Stony Brook came from courses not connected with my major. I know I'm not the same person I was when I came here for the first time. I don't know what to expect. Life is kind of like this too. We can fall into a predictable, repetitive routine, work 9 to 5 every day, watch primetime TV every night, or we can keep our eyes open, continually searching for something more. We can communicate only with those who share our thoughts and feelings, or we can expand. We can play it safe, remain the same, and learn nothing. Or we can expand our knowledge, shed our fears, and try something different. It's a choice that's completely up to us. While parts of the resistance change, there's another element that just can't wait to get the whole thing over and done with. We move frantically from year to year, running up the ladder of success without slowing down or stopping for breath. Some can actually survive life at such a pace. Others merely think they can. And when they finally realize that the standards they've set are impossible, their lives become miserable. They consider themselves failures. And they begin to lose their sense of direction and their ability to care. What they don't see, and what many of us haven't learned yet, is that there is no such thing as a complete failure or a complete success. Of all the people gathered here today, every last one will succeed at something, and every last one will fail at something else. There is not one person here who will be successful or unsuccessful at everything they attempt. I know we all have dreams and ambitions, like being, like being, like being, like being dry. Some will come true, others won't. What I'm saying is, when we encounter the latter, it's not the end of the world. Because this world is so large and varied, we can never run out of dreams. I've known people who've come to Stony Brook knowing exactly what it is they wanted. And after a while, they reached the conclusion that it was not quite what they had anticipated. So they embarked on a totally new pursuit and found much to their amazement a brand new world within them. 
one that they never would have discovered, discovered had they not yeah. failed. Yeah. It takes, it takes a, a lot of guts to, guts to do something, something like that. that. In the, in the coming years, I hope we will be able to admit it when we've made a mistake or when we find ourselves unhappy. After all, we can't hope to be honest with one another if we're not honest with ourselves. Before I conclude, I'd like to take this, take this moment to pay tribute to those who have helped me survive over the last few years. My mother and my sister for their patience and inspiration. To my grandparents for their generosity and kindness. And to my friends on and off campus for just being around. I just want to say thanks. So, thanks. One more page and I'm done. 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 You know, it's been said that today's college graduates want one thing. To make money and get a good job. Well, I don't mind either one. But there is more to life. And I hope we're able to see that in the coming years. The world needs us. Desperately. The world needs our ideas, our knowledge, our ingenuity. Our environment is being destroyed. Who will protect it? Educational institutions like this one are being hit with horrendous budget cuts as our students, the poor and the elderly. Who will speak for them? And right now, people are starving for food all over the world. The human race spends trillions of dollars on destruction. Who will try to stop this? Maybe it will be us. Maybe, maybe we can change the world, but we'll never know if we don't try. And so, we have at last completed the small section of our lives that is supposed to prepare us for the rest of our lives. One of our first lessons will be that we have been living the rest of our lives all along, and that the preparation for life will never cease. While our formal education may in fact be completed, we have really just begun to learn. Thanks. Good luck. Wasn't that fun?